Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, I guess this talk will probably look a little bit different than uh, what you're used to. I sometimes try to throw in a, a surgical slide, you know, of a of a um, a big surgery happening so that I can really connect, but uh, I decided not to do that. Although I consider myself an honorary urologist now with all of the work that I do with my colleagues um, in the gender health sphere. Um, so again, my name is Jill Blumenthal. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I have no disclosures, except there are gonna be a lot of rainbows coming your way. Um, I feel like it livens things up and, and brings some spirit. But um, why did I use my pronouns? Why does this matter? This is something that comes up quite a bit. And I think there's some controversy on whether you have to use your pronouns. You obviously don't have to do anything you don't wanna do, but I wanna explain the reasons that I use my pronouns. So using my pronouns can create a normalized space for people to share their pronouns. Um, someone who may not have pronouns that you necessarily think are theirs, then they might feel comfortable doing it. Um, it often signals to other people that you, your group, your organization, whoever you're with, you're inclusive and you have a basic understanding of gender identity. And then I think this is the most important part. There's a privilege of appearing in a way that fits your gender um, and pronouns that people associate with that gender. So by sharing pronouns, you can disrupt that normalization and the privilege of just assuming. And I think if there's anything you, I, uh, that you'll be able to take away from this, it's we never wanna make assumptions about anyone. It's better to ask um, and then go from there. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. We'll, we'll um, discuss some of the terminology around sexual orientation and gender identity. We'll describe the general prevalence of LGBTQIA plus people in the United States. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the common health disparities and risks faced by transgender and non-binary individuals. And then I'd like to take some time talking about strategies to make clinical environments uh, and visits more welcoming to LGBTQIA plus individuals, including within the surgical care arena, and then in general discuss ways to improve the healthcare of LGBTQIA plus individuals. I keep using that big term, which we're gonna talk about. I am focused a little bit more on transgender and non-binary individuals today for the purposes of this talk. Um, I just added this because um, I was I was playing around with the slides this week. I've given this, this talk before, but I always like to, um, to share some new things. So I'm sure many of you have seen this quote before, but I think this is really important for us to remember of all the forms of inequality. Injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman. That was by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And I think uh, for me, it's one of the tenets I like to use to practice care. Um, so why is it important to discuss this topic? Um, and if you just look at the graphic on the left, we know that healthcare is a human right and LGBTQ plus healthcare matters. Uh, there's a lot of, there are a lot of statistics that show um, that uh, gay individuals, and then I'll go further into transgender individuals, have felt discriminated by their doctors. Um, and then uh, below that, that LGBTQ patients are refused treatment. And they're in different, um, different spheres. Um, I'll, I'll bring it back also to heterosexual and bisexual women less likely to receive a pap smear, as ba you know, basic things like that um, as we sit in the Moore's Cancer Center. Um, and then the, the graphic on the bottom, let me just grab this for future. I think you can, there goes the... Uh, the microphone that I didn't need. Um, the At the bottom, you can see um, graphics comparing transgender individuals to cis cisgender individuals, looking at mostly mental health outcomes, so lifetime suicidal thoughts, attempts, psychological distress, all of these things are statistically significantly higher in transgender compared to cisgender individuals. So overall, it's important for us to address stigma, discrimination, and the health disparities that um, these individuals face. So ultimately we can really normalize conversations and maybe someday not have to have talks like this where we're really separating people out. Um, but ultimately the, the goal is to improve access and quality of healthcare. This is a this is a whole other topic we could spend a lot of time on, but the, the concept of cultural competence and, and responsiveness. I think cultural competence is actually quite a low bar. I think we can be competent in a lot of things, but I think actually having sensitivity and responding is really what matters the most. 
And but but at at base, cultural competence doesn't necessarily mean that you endorse someone else's beliefs, but it does mean that you can make room in your world to let another person hold their beliefs. Um, and then cultural responsiveness is the ability to learn from and relate respectfully with other people um, of different cultures as well as your own. And there's a lot of uh, there's a lot that's inter uh, at interplay there. So behaviors can affect practices and policies, ultimately affecting um, policies and structures. And, and all of these things are interconnected. And it's just good to remember um, when there are things that you don't necessarily agree with, you know, ask yourself, is this something though that I can make space for? Is this reasonable for me to do? And I'd argue that most of the time it can be done. Um, so we'll get into some terminology and gender affirming care basics. Um, I hope I really hope you'll ask questions because for me this is this this is stuff I've been doing now for years. Um, but I know a lot of people haven't seen this as much. Um, by a sh by a, um, a show of hands, how many people have seen the gender unicorn at some point in their careers? Okay. I generally notice I'm not going to be ageist, but often I, I see it in our younger, our younger, um, our younger trainees often are seeing this more and more in, in education. I always like to make the point um, now that I'm in my 40s, um, we didn't get any of this when we were in training. This wasn't at all part of what I got. Um, I've had to do a lot of this education on my own. I'm really happy that it is now happening in training. Um, and I think, again, we won't have to do this, but it's okay that you haven't seen it. You're going to see it now. So the gender unicorn is the most basic way to think about uh, gender identity and sexual orientation. So gender identity is the concept of 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 where of how you conceive of your gender. It comes from your brain. There are studies that show that there are different um, neurologic structures that are actually that light up on MRI um, differently in transgender and indi transgender individuals that are similar to their cisgender counterparts who share the same gender identities. Um, and it's a spectrum. And that's what's meant by these arrows that you can fall somewhere on the line, on the, all of the lines of these. You're not necessarily supposed to be on one of the lines. Um, and gender expression, they don't necessarily match up. So even if your gender identity, and my gender identity is, is female, although I definitely have some male, um, there's some male identity in me. I'm a and I'm, I'm just about to make a stereotype, but I'm a huge Knicks and Rangers fan. If, um, and I'm from New York, that's why I use my hands a lot. It's been a really exciting uh, series for me. Um, but gender expression is your outward expression of that um, identity, and it might not match up. You might be someone who is who has a female identity, but has a lot of masculine characteristics. And that's why we can never make assumptions just by how someone appears and, 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 and looks to us. Sex assigned at birth. We really try to not use the term biological sex because um, it is based on the genitalia that is seen by a provider when a baby is born. So we say sex assigned at birth. It was what was written on a legal document and that can be female, male, or intersex. Um, and people do try to get these changed um, ultimately uh, later in life so that that can look different. Um, physical attraction that comes from your heart. Who do you, you know, what, what gets you excited? What turns you on? Um, and again, that can be a whole host of things and, and a, a, a great mix. Emotional attraction may match up with physical attraction, but it may not. And again, it can be um, a mix of these things. Um, I like to tell people that when I first started looking at this, I was sitting with, at my time, my seven-year-old niece and my 88-year-old grandmother, um, and we had a long discussion about it. Um, my grandmother still thought it was kind of interesting that we were doing this, but um, I do think it's something that, you, you know, you can think about. If anyone has any questions about this, happy to answer, um, but this is a very basic way of thinking about these, these terms. But I am going to go through the letters a little bit more closely. So what do all the letters mean? People are like, you keep adding letters. What is this all about? Um, but the, and, and there are lists of them, but in general, LGBTQIA, and then 2S is for two-spirit. Um, that's a, an American Indian term that's um, been brought in. But um, I think most of these are, are probably you've, you've seen before. The, the Q is, is Q is queer, but also questioning. That's often in a lot of younger people who are sort of exploring um, their gender identity and sexual orientation. 
And then the A or people will fall on that spectrum of being asexual, agender, aromantic. I'm just gonna go through the basics. So um, when we say cisgender, that is a person whose sex assigned at birth matches their gender identity. So a cisgender female, I'm a cisgender female, I'm a person assigned female at birth and my gender identity is a woman. Um, intersex, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this term, it's a person whose reproductive organs and genitals didn't develop as expected. So there may be a mix of some. Transgender, their gender identity and assigned sex at birth do not correspond. Um, you may see this written as trans woman, transgender woman. Um, and I wanted to make the point, you, you might see male to female or M to F. That is actually a very old term, something that I, I try to, if I see it in, in, the, um, in the chart, I may send a gentle reminder to someone to say it's actually an outdated term. Because the idea is it's, it's sort of anchoring someone to their sex assigned at birth and something that they really may not associate with. So it can be, it can be very triggering for people. So really just um, recognizing what their gender identity is. So as someone who is male to female, they are a transgender woman woman is the part that they focus on. Um, gender queer is someone whose uh, gender identity or expression, um, or they don't follow that for their assigned sex. It may be a combination, neither, both. Um, I'm going to skip gender non-conforming. I believe it started and now the star is gone as we just don't use that as much. Non-binary is a very common term that we use. And it's a person whose identity with binary expectations or that, that doesn't follow the binary expectations of being strictly a man or strictly a woman. Again, as you see younger patients, you're going to see more and more of this. And we'll talk about that for prevalence. Um, these are heterogeneous terms. Um, it represents a spectrum of identities they can change over time. I think that's what gets, that can be very confusing for people. Um, you know, hey, I saw you last time and this is what you were telling me. Um, and, and it can change and that's okay if it changes as long as you appropriately say, hey, thanks for letting me know and, and then you move on. Um, they also don't preclude each other and people have ways of um, identifying themselves. Again, that might not make sense to you, but it does make sense to them. Obviously, we're scientists here. There are some things that our brains probably won't allow us to, um, to hear, to think, but most of the time there is sense there. Um, they're not exhaustive and um, uh, terms can vary, but I think more importantly, terms can change. So I used to say eight years ago, I said gender non-conforming. I hardly use that term anymore and say non-binary instead. Um, you'll see me in uh, later parts of this. I'm going to describe this population as the transgender and gender diverse population. You'll see it as TGD. Um, that is the most inclusive way of describing this population. Gender affirmation, I just wanted to give some basics of what I do and some of my colleagues do. These aren't things that you'll be doing as a neurosurgeon, I, I, can ima I, I, I can't imagine, but there are aspects of this that will fall in your lap. So gender affirmation is the process of recognizing, accepting, and expressing one's gender identity. And the two arenas that you may play a role are the social, emotional, and the psychological arenas. So social, emotional are people changing their names, maybe choosing different pronouns, starting to dress differently, coming out to others. Um, I want you to think about that for a moment. Someone who, you know, for all intents and purposes was a boy their entire life and probably have been struggling with this for a while and the age of 20 something they decide you know i'm going to enact this and i'm going to i'm going to really do this um and i'm i i feel like i'm a woman everyone in their life every person that they see the the barista that they see at the you know at the coffee place the person that they run into getting their mail they're all going to see this happening before their eyes it can be really hard to do that. Um, so I think, you know, that process of if someone is able to share that with you and you can, you know, offer an open ear, I think that's great. And I don't just mean that in the medical world. I mean that for people in your lives, because you are going to start to see this. And I imagine that there are people in here who have had that experience with family and friends. The psychological arena, again, is this process of gender validating. Like, it's okay that this is the gender that you experience. Um, you know, it may have been something differently before, but it's a very difficult process for people internally, partly because they're constantly experiencing internalized stigma and transphobia, um, which also can be external to them. The medical part of it, 
hopefully you won't really have to deal with much, but there are hormones and surgeries and there are non-surgical aspects to this as well, like voice therapy and hair removal um, that me and my colleagues do a lot of. And then the legal part, and I think this is what gets very confusing and epic um, and something that we've spent a lot of time working on as a group um, is the, the identity documents that are attached to people's driver's license, their insurance cards, anything that they show um, to prove who they are. And if you're in the process of changing that, it can be really challenging and very difficult. And they're often, you know, explanations, well, I'm, I've started this process. My insurance still has my 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 um, my dead name or the name I don't use anymore. Um, so it's really confusing, and that can be just hard to explain. Um, but but these are the processes of gender affirmation that we we do uh, or that we follow. There is treatment guidance we use. There, this isn't just made up. Um, although research is definitely need, needed in this area, um, the Endocrine Society has a practice guideline. Um, I'm going to skip the second because I'll get back to that. The one that I use the most, the guidelines for primary and gender affirming care of transgender and gender non-binary people. This came out in 2016. And it's still really, really, uh, it's fabulous and it's really easy to access online. Um, if you just type in guidelines, UCSF, um, transgender, these will come up. But the guiding principles that really our insurance companies follow and why we have to use a lot of this is the WPATH, which stands for the World Professional Association of Transgender Healthcare Providers. Um, these just got updated in 2022. Again, not a huge impact for you, but I just wanted to show some things that came out that do affect a lot of us as, as providers. The W path was definitely much more binary. It's now much more inclusive of the entire community. Um, there, there used to be mental health exams that had to happen before people could get hormone therapy. You don't have to do that anymore. There are shortened times before genital surgeries. Um, you used to have to say that you were living congruently with your, with your gender in order to obtain gender surgery. Um, that is a very big ask for people where they don't feel connected to it. That's gone too. There are fewer um, uh, planning letters of readiness. This is what I wanted to get to because this is, this is what I think applies to all of us. There was a call to action and it's that we recommend all members of the healthcare workforce receive cultural knowledge training focused on treating transgender and gender diverse individuals with dignity during orientation and as part of annual or continuing education. Um, for those who... Um, anyone who started here should have received, starting in 2018, um, about a 30-minute uh, talk about these, these, these topics. You probably don't remember it. You probably, like anything in the UC learning, did it while you were doing other things. We are trying to update that, and we do think it should be a yearly um, maybe we can get rid of the fishing one because I think the fishing one is really, um, you know, annoying to have to do. I'm joking. I think fishing is very important. You know, the, the learning modules that you get. Okay. Anyway, so this is an important thing that we need to be doing. Um, sorry. I think that stays longer. All right. A little bit on epidemiology. So LGBTQ plus people in the United States, about 7% of people in the U.S. identify as LGBT. And I want you to look at the 2022 statistics. So Gen Z, our young adults that will keep getting older are more and more identifying as LGBT. Is it a trend? I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe for some people they're, they're doing what their friends are doing. I, I think this is also because people are now accepting that it doesn't have to look the way we've always said it has to look. Um, so you're gonna see more and more young people that are identifying this way. Um, and then the Williams Institute has something that, that similarly reflects that where you practice by state, that also is going to impact the number of LGBTQ plus and, and transgender individuals you see. California, I believe, is the second, um, second largest LGBT population um, in the United States. So you're going to see people. San Diego, um, just wanted to show that um, there is a range somewhere between 7 and 15 percent, depending on where you are. Probably no surprise, Hillcrest. Um, and that central region where most people reside. There are estimates that in San Diego, um, about 1% of people are transgender and non-binary. And again, that's gonna vary throughout places. I removed some of my, the data that I've had from um, other countries, but in places like India, percentages are up to three to 5%. So uh, depending on where you are and, and the culture that's there, there is, there is more of that around. Um, 
So some healthcare considerations. Um, how are we doing with all of this? How are we treating people? Um, I'm just going to go back to a 1994 survey of physicians. 90% um, witness verbal disparage disparagement against LGBTQ plus patients um, and 67% witnessed inferior treatment. Um, there, there is more recent data, but I think this was a, a, a good comparison. To, so in 20, 2015, a survey of medical students, again, people on training, um, 50 to 80 percent experienced some degree of bias against LGBTQ plus patients. It's more implicit now. We're going to we'll talk a little bit more about implicit bias, which I'm assuming through these series you've discussed. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about risks that um, LGBTQ plus individuals, transgender and non-binary individuals, and really minoritized groups experience. I'm sure people have heard of the minority stress model. This is actually quite grounded in science. Um, and basically this shows that there are circumstances in the environment in conjunction with someone's minority status here, that being sexual orientation or gender identity that can exacerbate general stressors and then underlying that there are minority stress processes that occur on a regular basis, discrimination, violence, um, that then lead to certain processes, including ex expectations of rejection, having to hide who you are, and inter internalized homophobia and transphobia. Um, this, and then this all can lead to very poor mental health outcomes. And um, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit later, and I alluded it to on an earlier slide, but LGBTQ+, plus and particularly transgender um, and non-binary individuals have some of the worst mental health um, experiences um, of any group in the in the United States and, and in the world. Um, but this is also met with many measures of resilience. Um, this is a, a group that is that is still living and thriving and there have to be some resilience factors at play. Um, there, you know, there are people who have great self-efficacy skills, who have learned to accept themselves. They do proactive coping. You know, I know that this is going to be hard to go to the doctor today. Um, I know I'm probably going to be um, misgendered or dead named a few times here, but I'm going to I'm going to do some things in advance of this visit that will feel good for me. Um, they find social support and connectedness. There are safe spaces. There are now more positive media portrayals. There used to be terrible negative media portrayals, um, and there's a lot of social activism. So some of the health disparities that I've alluded to in transgender and non-binary individuals, they have lower routine cancer screening rates. Um, they are, are at increased risk for substance use disorders. Um, and the way that I got into this area, it was through HIV. I am um, an HIV clinician, increased risk for HIV and sexually transmitted diseases. And I talked about increased risk for mood disorders. And then in general, um, all of the groups, and I, I wasn't talking about gay and bisexual men or, or lesbian women, um, but in general, they are less likely to receive routine health care or have delayed care. So you may see these people coming into care late. Um, they will often report unfair treatment from the medical team, um, and they experience uh, large stretches of time of houselessness. This is as uh, there are multi multi level reasons for that that go back to childhood being rejected by families, having to leave homes, um, not being able to get jobs because um, there is discrimination against them and are, often aren't good protections. So there are lots of reasons why this occurs. And then all of this obviously becomes somewhat circular. I just wanted to remind people that in 2020, 2023, the ACLU is tracking 501 anti-LGBT bills um, and they're happening all over the place. There are, um, I have California is listed here. There are bills that get you introduced in California that are that are um, that are anti LGBTQ. They often don't go anywhere, but we know that things can change. Um, so um, and and just so you get a sense of the the growth over time. Um, I mean, we're almost tripling the amount that we had in in twenty twenty two. And the human rights campaign has declared a national state of emergency for LGBTQIA plus people. There are certain states I would never tell a transgender or non-binary person to go to. Um, and we actually see a lot of patients coming to California um, to get their medical care and to be in a safer place. 
Okay, so what is the provider role in medical care of transgender individuals? Um, one of the biggest barriers to healthcare is cultural competence and sensitivity. I talked about this at the beginning. So if you can't practice competently, that lack of sensitivity often results in patients avoiding healthcare settings for years. Lambda Legal um, did this very large study in, in 2010. It's been updated, but the results aren't out yet. So this is a little bit dated. Um, bear that in mind. Almost three quarters of transgender respondents believe they would be treated differently by medical professionals or medical personnel because of their LGBT status. And over 50% believe they, be, they would be refused medical services. And many are just scared to go to the doctor for a variety of reasons. 20% postpone or don't access health care in the past year. So this is sort of where the state of things now, maybe somewhat improved over the last few years, um, but people are scared. Um, so what are some of the things that you can think about to help change this? How, how many people have taken the implicit bias tests out of Harvard? Is this something that this group has done? Okay, great. Um, so there, so one of them, and if you haven't done it, you can go to one about LGBT people, LGBTQ plus people. So you can see if you do hold any implicit biases. And it's okay if you do. That's not something that you're necessarily doing, obviously, intentionally. There are a lot of factors that go into how biases are formed. So I think it's important to go back and think about this um, in the practice that you do. And it's really great to see that so many of you have done this here. Um, so one of the things that you can do in the patient's room, and these are the two points I really want to stress, and I know it might be hard and it might not feel natural and it may not happen all the time, but you can start by introducing yourself however you like to do that. I usually say, hi, I'm Dr. Blumenthal, but patients call me Dr. B or Jill. I use she, her pronouns. Then I say to them, this is the name that I see on your label here. Is this how you'd like to be addressed? And I think we all go into rooms and we generally say Mr. Smith or Mrs. Smith. You're making a huge assumption right there that that's a person that would like to be called by an honorific. And I work in Hillcrest, so I'd say 98% of the people I see there would be would prefer to be called by their first name. So that's the first thing. You're They're in a doctor's office. There are very few people. And with what y'all do, I'm sure they're not so excited to be in the neurosurgeon's office. So making them feel, although you're doing wonderful work, I'm sure they want to feel as comfortable role as possible. So if you get that, that's a great start. And then you can even say, and I just want to make sure I have the right pronouns here. I'm also going to show you how this can be done before you even get there. And this maybe becomes less on you. Um, ask sensitive, open, and direct questions about gender issues, orientation, and risk behavior. Again, maybe a little bit less of what you're doing. Um, try to use gender neutral terms like partner, spouse, instead of husband or wife. Obviously, if you know someone and you've met them, it's absolutely Absolutely fine to default to that. But when you don't know someone, try to use more general terms. Um, oh, is that your child over there? Um, will your will your spouse be joining us today? Um, and and someone may say, oh yeah, yeah, my little boy is coming over here right now. Then call them the little boy after that. But lead with you know use what the patients and the you know patients family members are saying. And then this is the court. Don't make assumptions about people. We all do. We know that it's ingrained, but try not to do that. Um, and recognize that gender and sexual minority stress is a risk factor for mental health disorders and other things that people are experiencing. Um, this is a picture of what I wish more rooms looked like. This was drawn by now um, uh, an ID fellow who used to be a, a medicine resident here that we have in a book made by, uh, or that will come out by Charlie Goldberg. Um, and this is just, you know, the way an inclusive room might look. I know it's really hard to put things up now because of all the um, uh, all the OCGA regulations. Um, so it's harder to do that, but there are things that you can do um, to make patients feel more comfortable. So conducting a physical exam, they can be really physically and emotionally uncomfortable for people. So in order to increase their comfort, if you're gonna be around specific anatomy, you can say, are there words you'd like me to use for certain body parts? Um, in general, and I ask this of a lot of people, usually people say, yeah, call them what they are. You know? And I don't know how often you are, um, you are looking at more sensitive body parts, but um, I would imagine that patients do um, end up getting undressed in, in your offices. So we can talk about 
sort of best ways to do that. But explain why the exam is important, why you're doing it, why it's necessary. Explain what you're doing in the exam. Don't just do it. Say, now I'm going to be doing this. Um, and then again, I think less common for you, but good rapport before examining sensitive areas. And clinical care should be based on an up-to-date anatomical inventory. Um, I will show you this later, but we have an organ inventory built into Epic that, um, again, probably less likely for you to have to do, but it is something that people who are vitaling people and putting people into the room can go through really quickly. And then the data lives there. And it's something that you can look at if you're ever confused because there probably is an area where it comes up. But um, I think you all see the storyboard. Um, we've made some really significant changes to the storyboard. Um, I tried to get, we just updated it a few months ago, so it's still a little bit outdated, but what you're seeing here um, is what you would see. So what's um, in red here, that is a person's, um, uh, th that is their legal sex, but what it, if if their gender identity isn't filled out, and I'll show you where you can do that. But if it is filled out, then it turns into something like this. And this is what you'll see here. Um, you'll st still see their um, their age and their date of birth. And below that, in much smaller font, will still be their legal sex. So you have that. And if you cover over this area or click on it, it takes you into this box, which is the sexual orientation and gender identity smart form. You can fill this out with a patient. It can be done by patients themselves. Um, but this is where, so from here, this gender identity, this is what pulls in here if it's completed. If it's not completed, then it pulls from their sex assigned at birth, which is right here. Um, this is something I doubt you'll do, but anyone who is in the front desk sort of area, if you know that someone uses a different first name, if you go into the contact information, there's a little squiggle next to their name, you can enter their chosen or lived name there and then it'll display in the chart. Um, if anyone ever came to the Owen Clinic, we have we have a lot of fun there. People give us all sorts of chosen names that they prefer to be called. Um, and I think it can actually be a lot of, again, in a, in a healthcare setting that can be difficult and people aren't always happy to be there. Sometimes just seeing the name they like to go by can make a lot of this easier. This is what it looks like um, pulled out. The organ inventory is at the bottom. And unfortunately, it uses the epic, like if it's present, it's red. And if it's not there, it's green. We've asked to try to change that, but that's how epic sets things up. So it's, to me, it's not intuitive at all. Um, right now, it doesn't do anything like pull into healthcare maintenance, which I think y'all are, are not involved in, but I get a lot of health maintenance alerts. Ultimately, the idea is if someone um, didn't have breasts, I would no longer get an alert that this person is due for a mammogram. So our, our health system is, or, and, the, and the EMR is supposed to help us right now. It probably is more focused on billing, but one day we will get there. Um, patients can do this themselves. And for people who are on the front desk side of things, um, I, I, if they, if someone is calling in, they haven't done this. I think it's really important. It, it's mixed in with a lot of other things that people can do, um, but this gets filled out a lot more frequently. Um, the most recent update, because if you look here, there weren't pronouns. Patients now can select their pronouns. So if someone has done this before they come in, it actually will display in that SOGI form for you. So you'd have that information there. Um, Pardon some of the names here. I had nothing to do with this, but we've updated our, our wristbands, which were really, really bad because it only had someone's legal name. Um, so now what you see in big letters is someone's chosen name. That'll be what's really obvious. And the legal name, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for some, still has to be there, but it's in much smaller font. So that's with this Frankenstein person. <laughs> um, the, the legal name is still listed there in their legal sex, but this is their chosen name and this is their gender identity. And you can still see everything else that you need. I know that y'all look at wristbands quite a bit. So this has been an exciting update. I believe that came out in September. If you haven't noticed, take a look at it. I know I've asked patients and it's a much more pleasant experience. Um, I'd love to take some time here because I think I only have a few slides left. Surgical care of transgender and um, gender diverse individuals can be really challenging. I've heard 
So my job, sometimes seeing patients, I'm prescribing hormones. It's very easy. A lot of the times we're at a stable dose. So what I often do is, hey, you had your surgery last week or a few weeks ago. How did that go for you? And the stories I hear are very, very disturbing um, just in terms of the amount that they are called the wrong name. And they are literally there for a certain surgery where they keep being called, you know, their, uh, their sex assigned at birth and being referred to people in their, in the vicinity around them. So some things I think are, that are really important. Some of this is out of your control, I recognize, but front desk and operative staff should be informed of patients' pronouns. If they are pronouns that you think are a little bit more challenging, and I, I now can do it relatively well, but they, them throws a lot of people off, especially if you're above the age of 40 and you were taught grammar in the United States where we said she and he and nothing in between, but they, them can be singular. It's used singularly. If that is hard, make sure, make sure to tell your staff it's they, them and just correct them. You don't have to yell it out. Um, just make sure they're aware. The other thing, if you're having a lot of trouble, just keep using their name, use their name. It's okay if you say, you know, Brian is gonna be doing this. We're taking Brian upstairs. Can you go check on Brian's Foley later? That's okay too, if you're having trouble with it. Um, remember that transgender men and, and masculinized uh, or individuals who are masculine may have intact female reproductive organs. So pregnancy testing, that can be tricky. Again, I think it's probably something you're not specifically doing, but how do you ask that question to people that's sensitive? Um, so I usually just say, and again, this is why it's good to review the chart. Okay, this is someone who is female assigned at birth. Um, so they may have intact reproductive organs. Obviously, if they're of reproductive age, um, maybe take a quick look through the SOGI, see if it's filled out there. If not, you would say, hey, I want to ask a question um, that may be sensitive, but we have to make sure that anyone who's uh, sex assigned to birth as female has done a pregnancy test. Is that something that's applicable to you? Um, this goes for a lot of people. I mean, I have a lot of uh, patients who are lesbian who are like, oh my gosh, how many times am I going to ask that question? I think if you just you know frame it as I ask anyone who will have those organs about this, um, we, know, we must know this in order to do your surgery safely. Efforts should be made to minimize traffic and staff rotation in the operating room to protect privacy. Um, it's been a long time since I've been in an operating room. Um, I'm always happy to take an invitation as long as I don't have to retract. Um, but just again, you know, if, if you can keep the flow um, down to a minimum, obviously uh, sometimes that is necessary, but privacy is very important. It's important for all patients. Um, unintentional actions that lead to some patient distress should be confronted directly and resolution should include an admission that highlights the oversight or mistake, making this sound really big. But if you dead name someone, if you say the wrong name, just say, I apologize, I'm going to do better going forward. That's it. You, the worst thing you can do is say, um, I'm sorry, but I'm sorry, but I was busy. I'm sorry, but I was looking at this other patient's chart. Just acknowledge that a mistake was made and move on. I think that's um, probably um, good practice for most things that you do. Um, detailed report and handoff between providers are important when patients may not be able to accurately confirm their medical history or their name or pronouns due to residual um, anesthetic effects. Um, I know a lot of papers get transferred. I've I've had some surgeries, make the pronouns big, make the, you know, write the name really in, in large font on someone's paper so they can see that. Um, and then again, cultural sensitivity, sensitivity training for staff is essential um, in fostering these feelings of respect and trust. So what can you do outside the patient room? I'm gonna say this a few times, educate yourself seek out CME training on caring for individuals. Um, you can signal allyship with pins, pronouns, I'm, mine's a little too much sometimes, but little things like that. Very small, um, you know, if you wear anything. Um, if you see something, speak up by calling people in. Again, we don't want people to feel bad about mistakes they've made. I see this a lot happening on Zoom in Zoom meetings where someone will say someone's you know, oh, hey, is she going to come back to the call? I'll just send them a private message, say, hey, I think they use they, them pronouns. And I'm usually met with, thanks for letting me know. Um, again, um, you know, you can think about putting pronouns in your signature and your name tags, Zoom profiles. Um, it's up to you. 
think about some of the reasons why. No one use your local resources um, and refer them to people that you know are competent or caring for LGBTQIA plus patients. Um, I so appreciate y'all having me. I recognize this isn't be gonna become everyone's expertise or something that you spend a lot of time in. But if there is someone that feels very strongly and passionately about this, it's good to sort of identify yourself within your department. Um, and you can be someone that some, you know, that serves as a conduit or liaison um, to your department. That can be really helpful. We are using these terms champions um, and a program they're actually trying to um, have throughout the, uh, the health system. So within the health system, work with IT to improve EHR function. This is something we've worked on, again, within your setting. I think if you notice something, it might be worth sending me or some of my team a message because it's probably something we're aware of and we're working on. Um, change is really slow with Epic. It took us about three years to get to the updates where we are now, and I think we still have 15 more to go um, just to make, you know, to improve this. Um, be familiar with your non-discrimination policy. And this, there's a lot of irony here because we actually don't have a non-discrimination policy that includes LGBTQ plus individuals. Um, it is, it is, it is going to be worked on in the next year. Um, but there, but um, it is important to know this. And if not, you, you know, know who to talk to about it. Um, training should include all staff members. It's good to have LGBTQ plus educational brochures or at minimum have brochures that are very welcoming. It shouldn't just be um, older white people on a, on a brochure. You really wanna have a, a, a breadth of, of colors and, and gender identities so that different people can feel connected to what you, what you might have. Um, and I think this is important to remember your role as healthcare providers to provide a safe space and advocate for our patients. Um, you can acknowledge days of observance such as LGBT Pride Day, which is coming up in July, and then um, other holidays like the National Transgender Day of Remembrance. So as a physician, I think it's really important to develop an awareness of your privilege that you have as a provider. Um, I just watched Jerry Seinfeld's um, uh, his uh, his commencement speech at Duke. It's also important to use your privilege in ways that can be really helpful. You don't have to be embarrassed about your privilege, but I think it's important to be aware of it and recognize some of those implicit biases. Um, provision of care should be trauma informed, done through an intersectional framework. Firm framework, excuse me. Clinicians should possess thorough assessment. Um, skills and hold a recognition of overlap, overlapping traumas, excuse me. Um, the field is new, fluid, and evolving. There are things that are changing all the time, which is why ongoing education is critical. I did change this, and the last part of research is really critical as well. So if this is something that you're at all interested in, there is a large group of us that are involved in a lot of research efforts, both locally and nationally and beyond, um, so let us know. Um, some things that we have done, um, we have, through our Center for AIDS Research, where I come from, we have a transgender non-binary community advisory board, and it uh, it was created years ago to help improve and sustain the health and well-being of the transgender diverse community. Um, and we basically work together and include them, and help and and they lead um, in order to foster inclusion in health research and community events. And we developed a best practices report for identifying and including transgender and non-binary participants in research. If that's something that you're um, at all interested in, it's on our website. Um, there are a lot of resources that you have access to. And I, um, besides my own clinic, where we see a lot of transgender and non-binary individuals at the Owen Clinic, I most I really want to call out the UCSD Gender Health Program, um, which um, was officially launched in 2022. We have two employees right now. We have a program manager named Rai Kamisa who leads a lot of the efforts, um, both from an administrative standpoint, but also um, sees patients, gets them to places in the health system. And uh, for them, it's really important to know who some of the allies in the, in the health system are. Um, this, if a patient ever says, 
hey, um, I'm really interested in this, direct them to this website, their phone numbers, their emails, their places that they can go to start um, a gender affirming care process. Um, we've held a health symposium. Our sixth one is gonna be Jan in January. Um, last year we had uh, about 200 people come in person. It's really an amazing event. If it's something that, again, you're at all interested in, we'd love to have you. This year we're gonna have a little more focus on research because a lot of our trainees are starting to do research in this arena. Um, so to summarize, discrimination, stigmatization, and the lack of provider education can lead to health disparities for transgender and gender diverse patients, LGBTQ plus patients, and specifically transgender and non-binary or gender diverse patients are surgical patients. They are going to be your surgical patients, and we need to create a safe space for them. Uh, personal workplace and health system-wide changes can create opportunities to provide appropriate and affirming care for transgender um, and gender diverse patients. Resources are, resources are available to you and education is vital.